Hey everyone, how's everybody doing? We're coming back for uh, introducing our next act. This is going to be Tom Salta. So for those of you that don't know, Tom Salta is a composer. He's been working in video games for the last 20 years or so. He's done a ton of stuff. He's an incredibly versatile and talented music producer and composer. He's got some really prominent credits. Uh, he got his start in games with an ad placement, uh, you know, back around 2004, and he's been kind of churning ever since. He's performed under the alias Atlas Plug. He's toured with famous artists like Bobby Brown, produced music for artists like Cher and Peter Gabriel. Um, like I mentioned, he's worked in film, TV, ads, games. He's been all over the place. Some of the series, if you do play a lot of games, that you'll recognize... Halo, Prince of Persia, Just Dance, Wolfenstein, the Tom Clancy series games, and more recently, Player Unknown Battlegrounds, just to name a few. He's got a list of amazing credits. So Tom is bringing with him an amazing wealth of experience today to talk about scoring music for video games. First, we're going to start off with a video from the first part of his Masterclass series, and he'll tell you a little bit more about that in the live Q&A immediately following that. So enjoy the video and you'll meet Tom right afterwards. Hey everyone, this is Tom Salta. Good to be with you today. You're about to watch a 17 minute preview from my latest masterclass called Game Music Essentials. So I hope you enjoy it and I will meet you all in the live Q&A afterwards. All right. So good to have you in, Tom. <laughs> good to be here. All right. So I'm going to open it up with an easy lowball, like, you know, question. What is your favorite aspect of composing video games as opposed to, say, film, TV, some of these more linear music processes? Well, um, I think the favorite, my favorite aspect about scoring music for games is that it, allows i'm such a gamer and i've been playing games since the late 70s i'm old uh <laughs> that for me to do music in games it really allows me to to immerse myself in the experience you know just like vr you can be immersed in it i mean for me creating the music allows me to kind of dream like what i want it to sound like what what i want it to feel like it's it's it creates an emotional dimension or a layer that makes it real for me. And uh, I just love, you know, playing with people's emotions with music. You know, I like creating certain feelings, you know, whether it's like, in, you know, a uh, sense of power yeah. or, or, or winning or being scared or just being dreamy where you just kind of want to live there and you just like get lost in this other world. I just love the immersion factor. Yeah, that's something that I've always really loved about games too. I mean, I've been playing them since I was very young and I noticed video game music from a very early age and yeah. games have expanded so much in terms of scope and scale that every once in a while I will just stop and admire the vistas and listen to the music, you know? Right. Especially <laughs> these days. I mean, I, you know, I, in the older days, you, you didn't really have that kind of music that would, you know, make you want to live there. I mean, arguably maybe, you know, some of the earlier Zelda games like Ocarina of Time and things like that, that's where it started becoming like, Ooh, I love this. I just want to stay in this happy village, you know, but then it's gotten, you know, over the years, it's gotten so amazing and what you can do without limits. So here's a different question. One thing, and I talked about this when you were on our podcast, Pixelated Audio, a little while ago, you're sort of a chameleon. You're able to write in a lot of different styles. And one thing yeah. I've always wondered is, as a game music composer, especially, how do you approach it when you have a project that's maybe outside of your comfort zone or your wheelhouse or whatever, you know, you have a totally new genre that you're yeah. working in. Yeah. You ever hear about those actors who, you know, certain, certain ones that when they get assigned a role and you never imagine they'd be in that role, they kind of spend this time like studying those type, but let's say whatever kind of people they're trying to be or, you know, whatever and they really kind of become that person they try to immerse themselves in that that's the most comparable thing i could say that how i approach things that are out of my comfort zone uh i try to immerse myself in that music um i i reverse engineer it 
to when as I listen to it uh, and figure out what is it that makes it. What's the DNA of it? What is it that makes it this way? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I just try to turn that into a, a musical recipe, um, and then just dive in and just become that, you know, and have that kind of assimilate into what I'm doing. It, it's like being a musical actor. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's hard to describe, but that's the best way I can describe it. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. And that's something I've always really admired about game music composition is you you have a voice and an identity, but you also have to shift more with the project and say an artist that has a very identifiable brand, you know, they kind of put out their genre of music. Right. We do have a couple of questions in the chat now. So Bring them on. I'm gonna, the first one is, what is the split or proportion between music composition and sound design? Generally, I don't know. That probably in, in an average <laughs> video game. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, one could. I, I don't know the answer, and it certainly depends, right, on on the game. Um, oh, I meant like what you when you actually work on a project. Do you generally focus on composition, or do you also work on? Oh, sound oh, sorry. For me, it's nearly a yes. hundred percent music. Got it. I'm not brought in as a sound designer. Sometimes I've done small, smaller projects, more indie projects where they didn't have an audio designer in the team and they came to me first and they said, could you help us out? And I'm like, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Rarely I will do it. Sometimes I will, but normally what I'll do is I'll subcontract and bring in a colleague of mine who's top sound designers uh, and then have them work with me on that. But that's something that I don't do. I don't usually spend too much time fiddling around with sound designs and making the perfect footstep or, you know, mm -hmm. rain sound. However, that being said, uh, I, in fact, I'm doing a project right now, which I wish I could talk about, but I can't, <laughs> uh, where uh, a good deal of the music that I'm doing, I find that I'm, I'm creating some of the unique sounds and textures in it by starting with sounds mm -hmm. and turning those into musical instruments, you know, uh, yeah. just to really kind of subliminally communicate where we are or what this is or mm -hmm. what the vibe is. And sometimes I'll go to the source sounds to try to create a new unique texture out of that. So sometimes I'll call it, you know, musical sound design where, you know, sometimes if you listen, uh, I don't know, I'm going to rip something out of memory, like Prince of Persia, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, yeah. like there was some areas where we were in the sewers, you know, underneath the palace and stuff. And I, and I remember it was really cool. I used some instruments. In fact, there was this, other gentleman, Michael Maisley, who created this instrument, which had water in it. And it, 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 like, it was like a kalimba with water. And I forgot, he came up with a unique <laughs> name with it. It was this really exotic instrument. So like every time he plucked it, you'd hear like, boink, you know, with water in it. So like th there cool. was like this watery, rusty, metallic texture to the music that I did for it. And you kind of feel like you're there. You know, so yeah, I, I, I try to do that in a lot of my music, but I, you know, it's not just sound design for sound design's sake. Sure, sure. And that actually leads into the next question. This is kind of something you mentioned about building up motifs. What is your workflow for creating the foundation of those key motifs? Do you start with progressions, melody, or, you know, as you mentioned, kind of that textural sound design based on the space? <clears throat> yeah, well... A lot of those key motifs will start with very, well, they always tend to start very simple. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, on uh, a game that's also coming out actually this September, which is kind of soon, uh, which I can't say yet. I wish I could. Um, <laughs> the, the motif really just started as a as a, um, a chord progression, four chords, and a very simple thing on a Rhodes. Um, and then... I just put that down and then I started coming up with a with a melody on top of it and then a counter melody and then it just expanded and then I started focusing on the instruments and the the, the authenticity of it and then making it put in the right time period and 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 the right production style but it usually starts with that infant that little tiny seed of a simple idea simple melody what have you you know mm -hmm. sometimes it starts with a groove I mean quite frankly uh, I remember like the theme for Halo Spartan Salt, which is this really cool choir part. You know, just choir. It's, it's, it's fun. I really like that piece. But it started out as a sort of an afterthought. 
I, I, I was actually trying to create a combat piece. So I was doing like this. And then I'm like, okay, this is nice, but I need something on top of it. And I just improvised in real time. Like this, I just found this choir sound and I improvised over this groove. I'm like, Ooh, I was kind of searching for the notes and all these neat, neat little half steps by accident. And I just felt my way through it. And by the end of it, I'm like, whoa, that's kind of cool. And then I took the, I took all the backing out and I was left with the new part. And I'm like, oh, there's the theme. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like one yeah. of those things. So I wish I could say, oh, well, I first do this and it's always this way. It's not. I mean, sometimes I stumble into it <laughs> and sometimes it's <laughs> deliberate. So, you know, it's, it's the creative process. What am I going to tell you? Of course. Yeah. And sometimes you're building on an existing framework or an existing um, series. So sometimes you have sure. some musical material to pull yeah. from. This was a question. I'm going to be jumping around in the chat, but what, sure. it, it said, you mentioned in the first five to 10 seconds of music, you make it unique. Yeah. So it says uh, to determine the game's kind of signature sound. That's right. Do you believe that the, that's also a good strategy for just conventional com composed music outside of games? I have to say yes. Um, in fact, I think if, right now, let's let's just play a game. All right. Think of mm -hmm. your favorite song, everybody. Think of your favorite song. Close your eyes and think of your favorite song. Now, just start it in your mind or hum it. Would you notice that song in the first five seconds, in the first three seconds? Is there something unique about it? Or does it sound like a million other tracks? I point. don't know. You know, yeah. Ch chances are. I mean, today it's a little funny because trap music, I mean, I think the kids make fun of it themselves that, it, that a lot of it just sounds the same because uh, they're using the same sounds and the same, you know, but but the kind of music, my favorite stuff always has a uniqueness to it. There's always that something that makes it slightly different. You know, I don't know yeah. what it is. I mean, even even aha, like take on me. Boo, cha, boo, boo, cha, boo. I'm like the only song I get that confused with is is the blinding lights because that's they took the beat from it. <laughs> No, I, I immediately you know? thought of this uh, track "Sometimes" by uh, Liz Rhythmus Digitalis. It's just uh -huh. got a very simple bass line, a very sharp synth sound, and it's uh -huh. you know, you're right. In like three seconds, you if know, I, it. I can hear it. My, yeah, exactly. Right, right. Yeah. So that's the world I come from, and and that's I guess what I bring to everything that I do is I'm trying to find something that makes it stand out, makes it unique. And Marty O'Donnell, by the way, I don't need to tell you who what he did, right? Uh, Halo. Halo. <laughs> for those you. not everybody knows <laughs> right well okay so marty came from the jingle industry mm -hmm. i mean he was the guy writing the simple notes you know we are flintstone kids 10 million strong <laughs> that he wrote that okay so he he came from that idea that you know you have to find that unique element that is makes it you stand out and that's you know, why he was able to help him come up with like, oh, you know, it's just like, what's makes that unique? Mm -hmm. There's no other, there's no other score that starts like that. No, I think that makes perfect sense. And, and coming from jingles, I still have, a, I'm sure we all have a few commercials that we still have stuck in our right, heads. Right, right. And years they're later. designed, <laughs> do you recognize them? And they stick in your head right no, from that's... the beginning. So that's, that's the same way I approach everything i do for the most part i mean you know. sure yeah yeah so we have two questions that are kind of in the same line this is when you're working in a technical capacity so yeah. this, the question is i want to understand how does non-linear music get packaged compared to say the you know how do you actually deliver the music because you have to break it up into little parts and that's right it, yeah so what is that process like yeah that's a great question in fact i'm i definitely plan on doing that as a whole standalone course soon too, to mm -hmm. talk about delivery. But in short, um, delivery in video games ends up being lots of little pieces. So, for example, like, you know, the game I'm doing right now, um, um, it will be delivered in chunks. Like this is an intro, this is the body, this is the looping part, this is this ending. Uh, here are five stingers that happen, um, you know, when I was working on uh, Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary, we had to mm -hmm. match the same deliverables that, that the original engine used. That's how they tricked it oh, into, wow. <laughs> into 
yeah. putting in a whole brand new score, but having it be exactly like the original game. In fact, everything was mapped on top of the structure. And that gave me a chance to look at the number of pieces and the files and how it was arranged. I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> so I mean, you had it was to... chopped up like every piece was like in 20 little sections. It was crazy, you know, and, and it's because like the way they did it, it was like, okay, when you get to this point, it goes to this section. And then when this criteria happens and it moves to this section, you know, so you have to give it in the slices so that the game or the middleware can kind of assemble it. Same thing with killer instinct. You know, it started as, let's say, a 12-minute solid track. Like, if you were to go to the soundtrack right now, listen to Killer Instinct Season 3 stuff, it's one continuous piece of music, but it wasn't delivered that way. It was delivered mm -hmm. in, okay, like, four-bar, eight-bar chunks. All right, so here's, yeah. you know, normal A1, normal A2, normal A3, a normal B1, normal B2, and, and we would communicate, we would set it up so that Wise, which is the middleware, Mm -hmm. would say like a jukebox okay we're gonna when when a normal fight is happening we're gonna toggle randomly between these and then when this happens it goes there so it's like giving the you know the game dj the little pieces to use so it can be reactive yeah do you find that the process of uh kind of smoothing over i know in the talk you mentioned that there was kind of like test and iterate was your part four yes uh do you find there's a lot of challenge in making some of those transitions smooth when you've kind of, you know, you've written it pseudo linearly and then you're actually testing it in the game. It's like, wait, that doesn't work. <laughs> I need to fix that. Yeah. yeah it, well, it, it certainly can, you know, yeah. even with the best planning, it, there, there certainly can be little challenges, but I've learned over the years that if I do certain things, I kind of know the, 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 the pitfalls like, oh yeah, that's going to cause a problem. You, know, mm -hmm. you don't want to go into this kind of thing or, you know, in the same piece, if you do a different time signature and it always has to feel musical and you chop it up into too many pieces, you might be setting yourself up for a problem. Or if you modulate too much to keys mm -hmm. that are not relatively pleasing, that could also be a problem. But if you know the relative keys, let's say, you know, we're, we're stepping up like we did this in, in Ghost Recon games. Um, you know, they modulated, but we planned on modulations that would sound good, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, next to each other. So if you don't plan on that, and then you go into testing and iterating, it could be a nightmare and a learning experience. So I'd say it's become a lot less of a problem than it used to be at the beginning when I was just discovering my way. And we didn't have all the resources that people have today to learn this stuff. It's true, but it does sound like you got to have a really good grasp on the fundamentals of yes. you know, keys and rhythm and all of those things and how they fit together yeah, in this very and, big right, puzzle. And understanding how it gets used. So knowing, even if you're not a programmer, knowing how it's used under the hood and knowing what simple ways to test it out yourself, you know? Totally, totally. So I think there was one more question in here. I think I got most of the main ones. Uh, there was one question about, uh, are there many, oh, hold on. It says, oh, right. This is always a great question. Yeah. How did you start your career? <laughs> oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> and which career yeah. are we talking about here? Yeah, oh, this is, God. yeah. There's this a... question is actually a two-parter. It says, how did you start your career? And as an aside, did you work on any chiptune or 8-bit or more like old school video game music? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, the second question is a much easier one. Not really. I've done eight bit stuff as kind of like Easter eggs that have been buried, like an, in Ghost Recon Future Soldier. I did an eight bit version of the theme, which is hidden somewhere in some abandoned building in some broken video game console on the ground. You know, <laughs> like you can hear it coming through. Uh, but no, I, I never did those games. Um, the starting the career. I, I'll give you the elevator answer right now, but. To learn more, uh, if you Google my name, TEDx, I gave a TEDx talk about this, uh, and it's a 17-minute talk, um, and it, it goes in much more fun detail with videos and stuff of how my career started. But for the first 15 years of my career, I was in the record business. I was making songs and songwriting, producing, programming, touring. In 2001, I got the bug to get into video games. And because I was effectively starting over with a brand new set of professional circles without any experience, 
or credits, I had to figure out, well, how am I going to be noticed? And um, I came up with this crazy idea to, to be, to turn myself into an artist. So I became Atlas plug and I put out an album mm -hmm. of music that was designed for licensing in video games, TV and film. And it attracted uh, thanks to my publisher, it attracted Microsoft and, and other companies. So my first video game credit was under my artist name, Atlas Plug. They chose record songs off my record that were already done. There was a game called Rally Sport Challenge. And then it went in Crackdown and then Project Gotham. And, and then eventually I started getting, I got an agent and I started getting chances to pitch on real, like bigger games. Mm -hmm. My first video game ever technically was a PC game called Still Life. It was a point and click adventure thing. It was a little grisly, but it was cool. Uh, and then uh, Cold Fear at one point, and then I think the first big one was was this one, Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter. Um, that was like one of the games where it was like, ooh, who's this guy, right? You know, Need for Speed Underground 2, what have you. So that's how my kind of career started in a very small nutshell. Got it. And here's a question that I think everybody always wants to know in talks like these. How yeah. do you, as an as a novice, get discovered, involved? How do you break into the industry, especially now as a, as a new artist? Yeah, uh, you will hear me say this a million times that it's all about relationships. And so, as you, I used to use the word "break in" a lot, and I know we all know what it means, but it also has this connotation of having to force your way. To break in, right? Like, you mm. know, meaning breaking <laughs> in is like no one's opening the door. You got to break in. I don't look at it that way. Uh, I feel that the best way is to be invited in, right? So, how do you get mm. invited into the industry? Um, the, and again, it has to do with relationships. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, for example, let's say you are you are starting out as a composer. Do you know any other professionals who are doing what you want to do? Yes, mm -hmm. maybe. Could you meet them? Can you offer to assist them? Can you offer to intern? Um, are there conferences like this in person that you can go to and make friends and meet people? And and maybe this person, oh, wow, yeah, I know this person. Oh, wow, what do you do? Oh, I, I do um, this kind of stuff where I'm a really great guitarist or I do vocals. Oh, really, I'm looking for someone like that. What starts to happen is you start to network and, and, and grow a new set of relationships and friendships. It's networking. Um, and uh, if, you, if you stay in these circles, these relationships start to grow and it takes some time. Mm -hmm. And I know everybody wants like, okay, what, what can I do? What can I sign up to and get hired next week? It, it, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. But it, it, you know, but it, it's like surround yourself with people who are doing what you, what it is that you want to be doing, and you'll start to see these opportunities come up. I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but that's that's the strategy. I mean, I think it's the truth, right? I don't think anybody's going to hire a, a nobody for a, a multi million dollar project, right? You know, no. you got to work your way up there. That's right, so. and people like to hire their friends. That's true. Yeah. Right. I, so, I, yeah. you know, with young, with, with young people, you know, now there's, you know, universities and colleges, all these courses and things that are where you have a lot of like-minded people that are, you know, in the industry. So even uh, Austin Wintory, I remember he was telling a story, um, you know, he went to UCLA, no USC and, mm -hmm. um, and his first project came from a student who was also studying in, I think the film thing or the video game program, I forgot, but he got his first chance to do something with someone at his, at his level or his contemporaries, however you want to put it, a friend, mm -hmm. a personal connection, right? So oh, yeah. that's how it happens. It, it's just, you start somewhere where you are and you start making connections and this person introduced you to this person. And then, you know, that's how it began. In fact, uh, I, I say this, uh, I don't think in the thing that, uh, that everyone has saw, but I gave this, um, uh, this talk, I remember, and I, when I was in high school, I started a network tree. This is before the internet existed, folks. This is like 1989. Okay. And, uh, I was always fascinated because I kind of 
thought I was somebody like in 1990. I'm like, wow, I'm doing this and I'm there. I performed here and I know this guy I went on tour with this person. How did I get here? You know, because mm-hmm. I didn't yeah, know yeah. anybody. My parents didn't like have a friend that could you do him a favor and give him, you know, but I, I tracked it down to high school friends, DJs. I tracked it down to hanging out in a music store where this guy walked in and heard me fooling around with a keyboard. I tracked it down to like all these little simple things that happened. And I just kept showing up and I just kept doing it and, and putting myself out there. You know, I'm not an overnight success by any means. My goodness, it's taken me forever to get where I am, but it was slow and steady. And I think that's so important to hear because I, I also have a, a small point of, of that in my own talk, which is just showing up, being around people. I don't think I know anybody that's a quote unquote overnight success. There is no overnight success unless you already have somebody who's in the record industry bankrolling you. You yeah. know, if you if you want to get there, you just got to be doing. And it even over if time. you do, I mean, a lot of times, yeah. you know, those people put in ten years of work, or they're doing craziness you know, before they got their opportunity. You know, people say that luck is preparation meets opportunity, right? Yep. They also say that, you know, an overnight success takes 10 years. So, <laughs> so anyway. So we're getting pretty close to time, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your masterclass before oh, we wrap up. So, sure. Well, well yeah. thanks. So if, if, hey, everybody, I can't see you, but I'm pretending I can. Um, for anybody that, ever wanted to get a good sense of what it takes to get in the industry and do it as a as a composer and a professional level every and you, what you've seen uh, I think is the first 17 minutes of the first video so there's a lot of information there um, but it goes through everything from how it works uh, all the way to the business side and the, and the mind that you need to have, you know, what are you, how do you set yourself up personally, business wise, everything. So it covers all of that in about three hours plus of very dense material. I think the, the, the only criticism I've ever heard is, gosh, it, that, there's so much stuff in there. Like I, <laughs> I, you should have spread that out in more courses. I'm like, I, I just, I just like cutting to the chase. Um, so, so it's a really great, it's called game music essentials. And if you want to, if you really want to understand what it is to, to make video game music, what it's about, how it works, it's like the best thing to do. Uh, the, uh, there's also another cool benefit of it that if you do sign up, uh, first of all, you get a chance to, um, schedule a personal call with me to create a piece of music and I'll, 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 um, critique it with you just like this one-to-one. Um, you also could get a chance to join a, a, a monthly group where we can have Q and A's like this every month and I'll see you on the screen. Uh, and lastly, everybody's in this get is a title to huge, huge discounts on major libraries like Cine samples and heaviosity. So if you're, have your eye, if you have your eye on like a certain library or whatever, and you join, you can get up to 50% off on some of this stuff. So it'll more than pay for itself as well. Uh, I also created a, a $30 off code for you guys. It's just for 24 or 48 hours. So if you go to tomsalta.com slash masterclass and you enter the code SVMP, that's all the right initials, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. SVMP30, okay? That's the code for 24 hours. You can enter it, you get $30 off. So that's all I'm gonna say. If anyone has questions, let me know. Yeah, I posted that in the chat as well, both the link to the class and the code. Cool. Uh, yeah, and uh, do you have any last things you want to say before we get out of here? We're right at about time. You know, one of the things that people seem to ask uh, is, you know, do you have to live in Los Angeles or, you know, um, that kind of stuff? I don't know if, how many people know, but I don't live in Los Angeles. I don't even live on the West Coast, right? I'm on the East Coast. I'm in this crazy state named Connecticut. Um, so no, you do not have to live in Los Angeles to do, to be a video game composer. It's more important still in TV and film, although less than it used to be. Uh, but video games is known to be an international kind of industry, very remote anyway. We're very, pr- pr- you know, pandemic ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so no, you don't, you don't have to be, it, it doesn't, it will only help your career because you can have these serendipitous meetings like, oh, wow, I just met this person at Starbucks, but it's not necessary to have a career. So that's that's one question I think a lot of people ask. And the next one is, hey, am I cut out for this? Is it? Can I do this? 
and, and I'll say this, I know I sound like a motivational speaker, but this is really the truth. If you have a passion and a desire, like, oh, man, that's my dream. I really love, love to do it. And it's real, like it's a real passion. It's not like, oh, I think I could make some money or that would be a good stepping stone. No, but if it's that mm -hmm. thing, like, oh man, I like you, it gets you excited thinking about it. You can do it. That's your calling. So I'd say pursue it. That's, I'd say, I'd say that is it in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this has been a really fantastic, Tom. Thank you so sure. much for being on. This has been super informative. I, I really hope that the folks in the chat have learned a lot. And uh, we are going to be getting ready for our next guest pretty soon. So uh, stay tuned. We'll be back in a few minutes. And once again, thanks, Tom. Have a great rest it. of your day. Thanks, Gene. <laughs> and thanks, everybody. See you later. Bye-bye.